Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Open Book Broadcast, where we talk about anything and everything writing and publishing, all the steps in between, and we are open books about it. I'm your host, Allie, with The Right Place, Right Time, my virtual boutique of writing, coaching, and ghostwriting services, and I am so excited for today's guest. I have with me today, Suzette Mullen. Suzette is a certified book coach committed to amplifying the voices of queer memoir and nonfiction writers. Her favorite part of coaching is helping writers find the deeper story inside their experiences, and she also finds great joy in fostering writing communities, which is why she's created Write Yourself Out, a community exclusively for LGBTQ plus writers. In addition to coaching memoir and nonfiction, Suzette writes personal essays and long-form memoir, Graveyard of Safe Choices, her memoir about coming out later in life, will be published by the University of Wisconsin Press in winter of 2024. Suzette is a graduate of Harvard Law School and Wellesley College and also holds a certificate in spiritual formation from Columbia Theological Seminary. A founding board member of the Lancaster LGBTQ Plus Coalition, she is the proud mom of two adult sons and lives in Lancaster, PA with her wife and their nine pound rescue puppy. Welcome, Suzette. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and talk about all the things. Oh my God, all the things. Like, I don't even know where to begin. There are so many things to like dive into. Let's just start with the nine pound rescue puppy. So what's the story? Yeah. Of? All right. Lu her name is Lucy. Um, and um, I think she's about five years old now. We, we rescued her um, about four years ago and they said she was about a year old. And the um the the down low on Lucy is that she's my first real pet ever because I was very allergic to cats and dogs growing up so I didn't have animals and my wife is a big animal lover and so this is a I've had a lot of later in life changes and this is one of them is becoming <laughs> um a dog mom and um I guess the only other thing I should say about this is that Lucy loves me when my wife is not around but when my wife is around I am you know I'm at best you know sort of like she tolerates me because Wendy is definitely her person so you know that that you that's the do? story on Lucy <laughs> yeah yeah I love it I love it um so Suzette like just tell us about you like who is who's Suzette behind the closed door <laughs> at the end of the day when like the office is like shut and business isn't happening mm. Well, gosh, um, yeah, I guess I'm a, as a memoir writer, I guess I, I can be pretty vulnerable because I'm, I'm about to, uh, at, you know, I love the name of your, of your podcast, the open, open book. So I'm about to become quite an open book when my um, book is out in the world. Um, well, I wish I could say I have it all together, but I think that, um, as we, um, as, as the older we get, I think the more we realize is that that sort of altogether stage never really happens. Um, I think that we're always, um, so if you haven't figured that out yet, you're younger than me, uh, let me tell you, um, it's elusive. And we, we, we wish, we wish we, we would hit this sort of calm, normal and everything together. But um, what I would say is that my life feels is very, very full these days in, um, and it feels very abundant. Um, it's, um, I'm, I'm finally doing the work that I feel like I was called to do my entire life. Um, I spent my 30s and 40s sort of in the wilderness wandering um, uh, uh, professionally, um, particularly I was a lawyer in a former life and a stay-at-home mom and volunteer and a lawyer again and all kinds of things. But I, I hadn't really landed on um, what I really feel I was put on this earth to do. And that's been one of the great joys of um, this chapter of life is really finding myself both personally and professionally. So who am I? I'm, I'm someone who drags her butt to yoga three times a week, um, at least, um, because I need that for my mental health as much as my physical health. Um, I'm a a recent convert to um, a pandemic convert to bourbon drinking, um, although I've been doing a bit too much of that. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm cutting back. I love great food. Um, I, I, right now I'm in my co-working space, um, which is a cr very conveniently across the street from where I live. So I, um, I get to be in community with a lot of other creatives and 
really interesting people, which gives me energy um, and gets me out of my condo. And I can bring Lucy here with me as well, though oh, she's not here with me. To, she's not here with me today, but um, yeah. So, and I, you know, I've got two young adult sons, as you mentioned in the bio, they both live in, in New York and I wish I saw them more often, but they're busy and I'm busy, but um, they're happy and healthy and um, employed. So um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty happy about all of those things. And um, yeah, I think, I mean, not that, that I could go on and on and I do like to talk, but I'll, I think I'll stop there. Okay. Oh my God. So I want to, I want to kind of stop for a moment and kind of like, so you've had all these like past lives professionally. Yeah. Um. So how, how, what was like the origin story of kind of coming to your story finder and then also landing on wanting to really amplify the voices of queer memoir and nonfiction writers? Yeah. Great. Thank you for asking that. So um, I had been doing um, freelance editing for a while. Um, I also did a lot of work with um, uh, high school students applying to college and helping them with their personal statements. So sort of like little mini memoirs, but I, I wasn't really running a business and um, I was just kind of doing it on the fly as people came to me. And um, after I went through, after I came out and went through my divorce, I moved to a new town. I had a lot of big changes. Um, part of what I decided was that I, it was time to really take my business um, seriously, take it up a notch. So it's like, I need a name. I need the LLC. I need the website and all the things. And um, at the time I was leaning into book coaching, but I wasn't full on with it. And um so I worked with a branding person um, and, you know, what's the name? And what we kept coming back to is that my, my, you know, my superpower, what I really, really love to do is I love helping people really find the, the deeper story that they, that they want to tell. So your story finder just kept coming up and it was actually available and no one else had the website and the domain and all the things. So I landed on that before I even really knew um, how perfect it was. And I've kind of grown into that. Um, and as far as the um, serving the LGBTQ plus community and amplifying um, the voices there, um, that has also evolved. Um, from the beginning of my book coaching business, I was focused on memoir and nonfiction. Um, I also, I'm certified to coach fiction, but I tend to read and also write memoir and nonfiction. So that was always um, the area I was focusing on. Um, but as I, I think, grew more into my own um, personal identity and then also the, my, um, my professional identity as both a writer and a book coach, I saw a real need for um, someone to kind of step out and serve this community. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of other editors and, and book coaches and professionals that work with the LGBTQ plus community, which is fantastic. But I didn't see um, someone that really had put a stake in the ground and said, this is, um, this is really who I want to focus on serving. And I was sort of naturally attracting um, uh, more and more queer writers. And, um, you know, the universe was just kind of saying to me, go, go for it. And I resisted it for a while because I think like many entrepreneurs, it's, it's hard to, you know, say, say yes to a particular, um, group or service, because then we're like, oh, what about all the other people? What about the straight people that I'd like to work with? And what I kind of joke and I say, you know, I, I still work with straight people. It's not that, you know, I'm not, I don't have a, you know, a sign <laughs> like no straight people can apply, but this is where I'm putting my energy and my marketing. And, um, and as you mentioned in the intro, I'm, I'm building a community, um, a 12 month mentorship program for LGBTQ plus writers. So it's just evolved over time and it feels really right. It feels really aligned with my, my writing and my life and all the things. Yeah. I mean, I feel like evolution, right? The, just the idea of change and growth, like that's the only thing that's really constant, right? Is mm -hmm. the fact that nothing ever stays, nothing ever stays the same. And 
you know, from one business owner to another, like, you know, when I, when I kind of like came out onto the scene for, as an entrepreneur, I really wanted to just predominantly work with women, like women, 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 women. And in the last few years, I was like, is that the thing? Like, because I'm not anti-man and I, and Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I love the LGBTQ community. Right. And not everybody identifies as, as women. So I, 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 I've now gone through this like tr- transition here in the last year of trying to take women out of everything um, and finding, figuring out how do you say that I, I how do you say I don't want to work with, you know, <laughs> racist, homophobic assholes? How do you say that without it being really jarring um, <laughs> in your marketing? So like, I'm still kind of figuring out what the language is, but ultimately the point being that you know, we do tend to evolve over time as we get more comfortable in our business, as we get more comfortable in what it is we want to do in the world, as we figure out what we really think our purpose and mission is, you know, and I think for me, like my thing is like, there's not enough diverse voices. And so, you know, um, obviously being, being a woman or identifying as woman is one kind of identity where I don't know that we have enough voices, but there's so many others and, um, sure you know, figuring out like, well, how do you, how can you position yourself to be that conduit for the voices that, you know, are not heard enough that are not out there. Right. And so it's very empowering to put the stake in the ground, but yeah, as you're, as you're strategic, yeah. like, but I need to make money because I'm an entrepreneur, Yeah, like, you know, like there's that other kind of voice, like, is this the right thing to like niche down my, you know, my audience, my, my target of who I'm trying to, who I'm trying to work with while still holding welcoming and open space for the people who don't identify as however I've classified myself in all of the marketing. Yeah, I I just want to speak to that for a moment. Um, One of the writers that I've been had the pleasure to work with over the past year and a half, um, her name is Sarah Wells. She's a a straight um, white woman um, and an amazing entrepreneur. She um, she runs a multi million dollar um, company called Sarah Wells Bags, and they make breast pump bags and accessories. I mean, who knew that this was even a thing? And it's it's amazing. And she's an incredible um, advocate for, for women in the workplace. And we've been working on a book uh, that she has now sold, which is really exciting. But she's got a big Instagram um, following. And one of the people that, and she's been amplifying my um, my services, which is great. And one of the questions she got asked was, you know, does Suzette work with uh, straight writers? And um, she said, yes. And then she started reading my, my mission statement on my, um, on my website. And she was just saying, you know, this is how I knew I was really aligned with Suzette because I've got, you know, Black Lives Matters and Black, Black Lives Matter and, lo- you know, love is love and all of the things. So speaking to like, well, how do you say who you don't want to work with? Well, you put up your, your statement of, of what you believe and who, who you want to work with. And you're just, it's kind of like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to get a lot of racist, um, homophobic people coming my way. <laughs> and that, yeah. that has not yet, yet, that has not yet been a problem for me. So, um, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think, I think those statements are hugely important. I should probably go back and look at mine. Um, I wrote, I wrote mine a couple of years ago and it's available on the website. It's, in, it's kind of in the, in the footer. Um, right now, but like, I need to go back, kind of reevaluate, does this still say accurately, yeah. like what I'm about and like, where can we kind of like lift this so that it's more, more present and available for people to more easily find. Sure. Um, but let's, let's get off of that yeah. you know, <laughs> soapbox um, Marketing. and yeah. talk <laughs> about, talk about, well, so I, we've kind of touched on it, but let's kind of go into like more explicitly stating, you know, why, why does the queer community, why do their stories matter for one? And two, how does this new mentorship program um, that you have, the um, Write Yourself Out community, how does that kind of work to elevate those voices? Yeah, well, I mean, this, why why queer stories matter, why, um, because representation matters. And I think that what I hear over and over again from the queer writers I work with, and I certainly had this experience myself when I was... Um, first coming out to myself and coming to terms with my own sexuality is I was desperate um, to read other books that um, were um, were of, of other authors who had experienced some of the same things I was experiencing. Because at the time, 
I felt like I was the only person in the world. I mean, now that seems ludicrous, but I think that that is a very common experience um, for for people um, in the queer community. And they need, you know, I don't, I don't think this is overstating it. I think that having reading stories of other queer people who have had a similar um, experience to yours and knowing how that they navigated it and they survived it, it can be a matter of, it can be life-saving for people. Um, and so I'm just, I, I, you know, if we reach a day when there's um, too many, you know, queer stories out there, okay, well, we can, we can revisit, um, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, no. You know, I've got a, one of the writers I'm working with is a trans man and um, he, came to both his um um his gender identity he had come he had come out um earlier in life um as a lesbian and um and then through a really interesting different uh journey to parenthood that he did not expect he through that journey he came to terms with his gender identity and wow. he's like I haven't read another book out there with, uh, you know, a, a 40 year old trans <laughs> trans dad who's, you know, trying to figure out how to parent a child with special needs, you know. And so there's so many stories out there with so many layers with, you know, specificity, but the universal of knowing that, um, you know, there are other people out there in the world that that you aren't alone, that you you can feel more connected, you can feel hope. Um, that's really, that's really what it's about for me. And what I, and one of the reasons I created this community, this mentorship program is that while I can, and I do work with writers one-on-one, -on -one, um, A, it's pretty expensive to work with me one-on-one because -on -one, um, it's my time and there's, you know. That's just awesome. Say, you know, yeah. yeah, well, it's just, you know, there's only one of me and if I'm working yeah. with you one-on-one, -on -one, it's just, that's just, you know, that's just what it is. And, um, and so I wanted the ability to work with more writers and what I've seen, because I've run some groups, small groups of, with queer writers before, is there some real beauty in that community um, mm -hmm. of, of, you know, it's over Zoom, um, but they're knowing that you're in a room when you're not the only queer writer in the room. In fact, mm -hmm. you're in a room full of queer writers. Yep. There's, there's just something really, there's something really magical about it. And I love watching those connections grow. Yeah. I just, I just do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, don't we all feel better in a place where we can identify with the other people who are with us, right? You know, when we can see some part of our own story inside them, which is why I also think memoir is so powerful, right? Why memoir yeah. has that ability to connect people on the human experience and how it can make somebody else feel less alone, less isolated, less uh, hopeless, less powerless you know, when they can see something about their own experience inside somebody else's story, right? Um, and so it's like memoir isn't written as a how-to, but I mean, in a lot of ways, memoir can be can be a guiding light, you know, for the people who are picking it up because something about it resonated with their own, you know, their own journey and their own experience. Um, and so, I mean, I have to imagine that like, you know, in, in collective, in a collective space, right? Where you already, you already get to come in knowing that the other people in, in that collective space identify as, you know, because, you know, unlike our, the color of our skin or whatever else, you know, our, how we, how we um, identify isn't always known, um, you know, who we're attracted to is not always known. And while some of us would think that these things, won't it be wonderful when we get to a time and place where these things just mm -hmm. don't matter? Um, you know, they do matter right now and identifying them and, and, talking about them matters. And so I think that it's really wonderful that you're, you're creating such a safe container for people to show up and be comfortable in that space because writing is vulnerable and how nice it must be to show up having one little piece, not feel so, you know, um, difficult because they're, they're coming into a community where they're already kind of, you know, like other people. Yeah. I mean, that's so true. Um, you know, writing, writing memoir in particular, writing period, but writing memoir in particular is very vulnerable. And 
the um, and 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 it's vulnerable whether you're in, in a room with queer writers or not. Right. Um, yeah. But but taking yes, as you say, taking that that layer away of um, of of fear of judgment, microaggression, all of that. And and what I will say, and as you know, I know you know, and your listeners know, but just to kind of say it out loud, you know, the queer experience is not. Um, a single experience there's there's a diversity of experiences both in terms of you know gender expression and then um and identity and you know who we're attracted to and how we identify and then all of our other identities you know whether we're (laughs) um, a person of color and you know our religion and all the other things and one of I was going to give her a second to come back online here with us. Oh, and she was on such a roll. The great joys for me has she ate and um, learn more about the diversity of the series. Okay, so that we lost you for a quick second. So um, we're going to have you repeat part of what you just said. Um, so you were talking about kind of the layered experience of identities, right? So not all queer experiences are the same experiences because we've got multiple identities, right? That then create, um, intersections and variety, right? Of what we go through in our journeys. Um, that was what you were saying before we lost you. All right. So Suzette, why don't we, why don't we just back up one second since we, we lost you there for a brief moment. So um, we were talking about the kind of the cross-sectionality of varying identities that, that means that like, you know, not every queer person is going to have the exact same, same experience because it's not just about orientation or identity. It's also religion and race and socioeconomic status and all the things. Yeah. And, and that's, frankly been one of the um the great joys of um building this community for me is getting to have a a broader understanding of of those different experiences um and um and and you know there there's there there are many many different queer stories to be told and um I in my in my in the group that I have right now, there's there's such a, a a great diversity. And that that to me is also part of the calling I feel is to get out a diversity of um of queer stories. Yeah. Yeah. So um so queer stories, let's talk about yours. <laughs> let's talk, let's talk about the yeah. book that you're, that you're writing that's coming out next year, very early on into 2024, that has a freaking fabulous title, Graveyard of Safe Choices. Oh my gosh, love. Um, So, you know, anything that you want to say about that? I mean, like, you know, how was it to write your own memoir, even though you're, you know, you're a coach? Like, you know, what was it like to find the University of Wisconsin Press? Sure. Yeah. So I, 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 I say that Graveyard of Safe Choices is both a coming of age and coming out story um, because I I came of age and came out very much later in life. And um, it's it's really for um, any person that um, feels closeted for any reason, Um, you know, LGBTQ plus people, um, women at midlife who feel like they haven't lived live fully um you know they've given up their lives for maybe their children um and their dreams not their lives they yeah that that that's that's not the way i don't say but they they they've deferred their own dreams for um for their family um and um also for perfectionists who are terrified of making a mistake um and people that are longing to live out loud and live more authentically but they're afraid of the costs and um yeah, that it's interesting that you mentioned the title um, because that's kind of part of the story of both writing my memoir and also the coaching I do is that is that 
what I love is that as, as I wrote and as I coach writers who are writing memoir, the layers just continue. You keep peeling away the layers to get to that deeper story. And I think many of us who write memoir start writing because we've had this experience that has had a lot of meaning for us. It's, um, you know, it's, it feels really big and we want to first understand it for ourselves. And, and we write initially to understand for ourselves. And then we write even deeper so that we can then get into that more universal um, truth that makes our story meaningful for others. And it really wasn't until I was several drafts in that I really got a better understanding of what my story was really about. Um, you know, we think that we should know that immediately, and we don't most of the time. Um, we know what happened to us because, of course, we lived it. But what does it mean or what's the what's the meaning that we're going to make out of it? And what I discovered in my own writing as I kept going deeper and deeper and deeper is that I had this pattern of making safe choices along the way in my life um, that came out of, you know, out of a childhood that was, um, you know, not a, not an abusive, not a, you know, a terribly traumatic childhood, but a childhood of being the, um, the daughter of, of two parents that were, that safety was the, the number one value. And so you didn't take risks and you didn't, you didn't put yourself out there. And I started seeing as I, you know, dug into my own story that this was my pattern. Mm -hmm. And so that it got me to a place where all of the signs had been there for, you know, years that I was um, attracted to women. And, um, you know, I couldn't even say the word like lesbian or, you know, I, I like that was just like really, really hard for me to even but I, I, I couldn't see, I couldn't, I, I couldn't see what really who I was because I didn't even allow myself to go there. And so long way of saying that that title emerged as I understood what my story was really about. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and it's about, I, I guess what I would say with, with the safety. Okay, so we were talking about how um, your title kind of emerged once you knew more deeply what the what the story was. Yeah, and I and I think that that is um, that's often um, that that's not a terribly uncommon thing um, when I work with writers, um, and I love working with writers from the very beginning of the process. But sometimes they come in with a full draft, and you know all the all the different things, but. A, a title is um, a title defines a concept, right? And um, so that's one of the things that we I play around with in the beginning is you know what you know what are some possible titles for your book and and it is not un, at all unusual for a title to evolve as a writer as a writer is working. Um, because the story will evolve and the meaning of the story will evolve. And that was certainly the case for mine. I, I think in um, one, of the, uh, one of the courses that I have inside my community, Write Yourself Out, um, we do this title exercise and I, you know, I give myself as a case study. And I think I, I've kind of lost track of how many titles I had <laughs> along the way, but uh, there are at least four other titles. And um and um, I have had a really great response to this title. So I'm glad that you liked it too. Oh my gosh. Love it. I love yeah. it. Um, all right. So Suzette, that's coming out winter of 2024. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. With the University awesome. of Wisconsin Press. And as we're recording right now, um, my book is in the copy um, editing stage. So I, 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 it's blissfully out of my hands for the moment. <laughs> And it will be returned to me. It's like a tennis match, right? It'll be returned yeah. to me um, 
in, uh, I believe, the middle of March, where I will review the copy edits, and then then they will really start, like, then the book is locked in. And um, I don't have my cover yet, but I'm eager to see what they're what they're going to come up with. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very exciting and kind of scary and all the things, and all the things. Yep. Yeah. All the things. <laughs> Sounds about right. Oh my gosh. I think that like getting the cover mock-ups back is like one of the like most fun parts of the process to like see what somebody else who's like not close to it at all like envisions for you yeah. know what's going to be like the showstopper you know like the people are are attracted to when they when they when they see it um so from like a publishing perspective one of the things that we talk a lot about on open book broadcast tends to be different types of editing and different types of publishing etc um so university of wisconsin press is this classified as an academic press do they classify themselves as a small traditional publisher like where do they position themselves in the market and how did how did you work with them as an author? Yeah, so um, university presses, um, you know, you'll sometimes hear, hear them referred to as academic presses. Um, university presses, many of them, and, and University of Wisconsin Press would be one, is that they publish both academic books, so more you know, more scholarly and textbook type things. But then they also publish what we call trade books. So they're books that are for the general public and um, a, a more general readership. And you'll also see with university presses, with University of Wisconsin is one of these, that they often have theories that sort of are, you know, speaking to a particular interest group or Re, you'll see a lot of like regional um, interests with different presses. And so University of Wisconsin Press has a series called Live Out, Living Out. And um, it is focused on LGBTQ plus memoir and biography. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a traditional press. Um, I, I, you know, queried them. Um, um, that, you know, just like you would query an agent, um, they, you know, asked for a query letter first, I sent the query letter. And um, one of the things that I'd like to point out to the people that are, are watching is that a um, memoir is, if, if you're, if you're interested in um, traditional publication um, with a, with a traditional press, memoirs is fun, this funny space between fiction and more prescriptive nonfiction. With prescriptive nonfiction, those are those how-to books, the self-help books, business books. You you pitch a traditional publisher or an agent um, with a book proposal. You don't necessarily have to have written the whole book first. Um, and with fiction, you have to have your whole novel done, your whole manuscript. You pitch the manuscript. Memoir. Here's here's sort of the tough news. You kind of need both. Um, I mean, you didn't yeah. used to need, um, always need a, a book proposal. And there are some agents and publishers that you don't need a book proposal. But we're seeing more and more that that is, is becoming more and more common um, that to, ha to be asked for at least components of the book proposal if you're pitching memoir. And even if it isn't required, what we're finding with that very competitive marketplace for, for memoir um, is that it really elevates your project. And so when I pitched my memoir, I said at the end of my query letter, I have both a, a proposal and a completed manuscript available. And um, they asked for the proposal. Like what's really cool, another little tip when you send out query letters, you might hear in minutes, you might hear in months, or you might never hear. It's it's really, and that's becoming more and more common. If you don't hear anything, it means it's a no. And um, I had plenty of those as I was pitching agents. Um, I'm sure I still have some out there, you know, in the ether somewhere. Um, but when you find an agent or a publisher that is the right fit, it often doesn't take that long. And um, I sent my query to the University of Wisconsin Press at about 11 o'clock one morning. And when I came back from lunch, I had a response from them, which was like, oh my God, hallelujah. <laughs> and things have moved along 
you know, fairly quickly, moved along fairly quickly with them. It's been a real joy to work with them so far. Um, I've been very pleasantly surprised by how much support um, I believe I'm going to have on the marketing side and, and, and all of the things. Um, I can talk a little more about university presses if you want. I don't know. I don't know how much you want me to go into the weeds. Well, on it, I actually but... have two questions um, sure. that I think would, that people would be interested to know. So your book's coming out in the winter of 2024, but when did you hear from them that it was a yes? So we have like a scope of like how long that time yeah. frame is between querying and then, and then publishing at least in this, in this example. Sure. Yeah. And yes. Yeah. So I queried them in March of 2022. Okay. So my book, my book will be coming out about two years after that initial query. The, the query process had many steps to it. You know, they first responded, yes, we want to see the proposal. They reviewed the proposal. Then they were like, yes, we want to see the completed manuscript, sent them the manuscript. Then there were, you know, there was a time lapse and then an additional layer of review for a university press. And this is something people who haven't gone this route might not be aware of is it's called peer review. And this is, you know, university presses have peer review, which means there's, they, they bring in, like if I was, it's a little easier to understand in terms on the sort of academic side, let's say I was, um, you know, a gender studies scholar, and I was writing a book on gender studies, um, mm -hmm. they would have scholars who were in that field review, read the book and make a recommendation, you know, sure. thumbs up, thumbs down and, and, and all of that. So I had peer reviewers for my book. And I finally got the, I got the yes in September. Um, so it was about six months, which is actually pretty fast. Um, and, um, I signed my contract. It's kind of cool. I signed it on coming out day. It just, nice. the universe just aligned perfectly for that Oh my that gosh. To that's going to be like one of the I best know. behind the scenes stories to be telling people as an author. Like, Isn't I that oh my it? gosh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so cool. um, and then the turnaround, you know, is fairly fast, um, because, we signed the contract in October and the book will be coming out about 15, 16 months later, which is, it's, is relatively quickly. Um, I, you know, I think typically for a traditional press, you're looking more at like 18 to 24 months. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know if that, I hope that helps. Uh, well, that's great because I think that, um, so a lot of the people that tend to watch an open book broadcast or even just the people that I work with personally, number one, they don't know anything about the publishing avenues. Um, but two, traditional is like its own beast and it, and it runs very differently, right? And then we have these like different types of offshoots of traditional. And I think university presses is kind of one of them. Um, but one of the things that people often don't know is about the timeline and don't understand why it can take so long. And so certainly in this instance, it sounds like Suzette, there was no literary agent involved. You went direct to the press, you were querying them. So that took out a middle person, but in a lot of other instances, you need the agent. So there is a middle person that's a gatekeeper. Yes. And then that can also tack on time and movement back and forth in the university press kind of situation with the peer review, right? Like that's kind of an added step, you know, that we're not gonna see necessarily in independent or hybrid uh, models. Um, though right. I always tell my clients that they should have a beta, a beta round, you know, where they are at least getting like ideal readers to give them some feedback so that they're not like the only eyes or I'm not the only eyes that are, you know, looking at. Sure. The um, now in the peer review instance though, were they just, was it like a pass fail or were they providing feedback and did you need to edit the manuscript based on that peer review feedback in order for the press to want to keep moving forward? Yeah. Okay. Great question. Um, I really didn't know what to expect because um, it was my first time and I hadn't, um, I hadn't worked with a writer who had gone through the university press pro process. Um, I was, I don't know if this is typical, but um, my experience was I got basically two really great detailed editorial letters from the peer reviewers who were anonymous. I, I don't actually know who I, one of them was 
happy to reveal later on who it was. So it's a, um, a, um, another author from University of Wisconsin Press. Um, but I got back these two great editorial letters. And um, and so the process was the 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 editors at the um, at the press. I was to respond. They wanted me to respond to the feedback and to um, write, you know, write my, a letter, basically how I'm planning to revise to respond to the feedback. And then they took that. Le- There's a lot, a lot of layers, <laughs> and I, you know, a lot of layers, a lot of committees, a lot of people who have to say yes. So then they took my letter back to the editorial board and there were the marketing people, there were more gatekeepers that had to say yes. Um, And so once that was done, that's when I was offered the officially offered the contract. Um, And then I had to revise the manuscript based on the plan that I had set out. And um, it turned out to be, I'd say a, it wasn't like I tore the book apart or anything like that, but it wasn't just like, you know, a little, some little tweaking it, it, and I'm so grateful for that feedback because the book is a much better book. Um, yeah. You know, they, they could see things that even though I worked with, I have a book coach and I worked with her and, and a lot of people had seen my book at that point. Um, but they saw things that, you know, we couldn't see and the book is, is a better book because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Which just like, so people, everybody watching, (laughs) you do not write in isolation. Like that's the moral of the story. There is no such thing as like the writer holed up in their house by themselves. Like, you know, just like pounding out the next greatest novel and shipping it off to a publisher. Okay. (laughs) There are like so many steps and so many people that are involved in really, truly making your book art you know, really, really making it sing and really making it powerful and impactful uh, because we just can't see it after a certain point in time where we're like digging in and 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 working with it, right? We need those outside perspectives. So um, it sounds like the peer review was great for that, you know, even it though it's already been seen. Um, awesome. So Suzette, we have to wrap up our time. Oh, I just yeah. talked to you forever. Um, we can do we can so, do a part two some other time. We will yeah. have to. We'll have to. We'll have you back yeah. when um Graveyard of Safe Choices is out. Yes, into the world. that'd be great. Um, I would love would it. Amazing. That'd be awesome. So where where should people follow you or connect with you? Or is there anything coming up that you would want people to know about? Sure. Yeah. Um, my website is yourstoryfinder.com. I'm sure you're gonna put that in the in the um in the show notes and you can find all out all about me and there's ways to get in touch with me there. Um, I'm most active on Instagram and um, it's your story finder, but it's you are story finder because somebody else took the other spelling. So yeah, yeah, the grammatical correct, but you can find me there. Um, And um, yeah, I mean, um, I've got a couple of things coming up. Um, I um, I'm co-hosting a retreat um, called mainly memoir and that's mainly with an E. Um, because it's going to be in Biddeford, Maine, historic Biddeford, Maine, nice. um, in September with um, two other book coaches. And it's for um, female identified writers. And um, it's going to be awesome. So you can check that out. Um, we'll put, I hope we can put that link in the show notes as well. Um, I've got a freebie on my website called The Queero's Journey, which you've heard of The Queero's Journey. It's The Queero's Journey. It's the five-step um, roadmap to completing your LGBTQ plus memoir. And, um, I'm, you know, opening the doors to write yourself out, um, as we speak. And I'd love, um, people can find out more about that on my website as well. Wonderful. So we are going to put the links to all of the things um, in the, in the show notes so that you know exactly where to find her, follow her, connect with her. And, um, learn everything there is to know from mm-hmm. from Suzette because she's brilliant and um she's 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 for the people <laughs> um so Suzette thank you so much for uh for being here with us today um folks uh I just want to remind you that we do open book broadcast now about once a month either live or recorded all depending um but you can follow all the other episodes on at the right place right time on YouTube Um, That's where you can find all of them. And in the meantime, if you're thinking about writing a memoir, I also 
focus on memoir. So Suzette's my people. Um, and over on my website, the right place, right time.com. If you go to guide, um, you can get the five step writing guide to finishing a memoir that lights up your world and ours. Um, so we're very in sync with our, with yeah, our those five steps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, check her out, check me out and we'll see you, uh, next time for another episode of the open book broadcast.